Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to A Late Show. Joining me tonight are the absolutely delightful hosts of my favorite podcast that isn't about the Lord of the Rings, the Slate Political Gab Fest. Please welcome to A Late Show, Emily Bazelon, John Dickerson, and David Plotz. Hello, you three. Hello, hey. Steven. It's so nice to see you. I normally just hear you on, on Thursdays or Fridays. For the people out there who do not uh, yet know about the Slate Political Gab Fest, which is, it was my, uh, what's it? It was my gateway drug for podcasts. It was the first podcast I listened to, so all of my podcast addiction is your fault. What days do the new ones come out? They come out on Thursday evening. What I love about the show is that it feels like, it's always felt to me, for those of us who are interested in politics, is, is that you're the fourth person at a little four-top lunch table on a Friday, and you guys are just talking about what just happened and what's about to happen in Washington or what the, the major issues are. How did it start? What's the origin story of this little, this little political Avengers? The first producer of the Gab Fest, Andy Bowers, said he wanted a show that would be like hanging out at the bar with the panelists on TV after the show. So forget the boring part, forget the stuff you were supposed to say. He wanted just like what people actually talk about, what journalists talk about when they're just hanging out. So that was the conception. And luckily for us, nobody really listened to the show for the first <laughs> year or more. And so we did feel like we were just hanging out because no one ever told us that they had heard it. And so by the time people started listening, we kind of had an idea of, um, we had a lot of trust among us about how to do the show. Because when we did the first show, we had A, no idea. And if you go back and listen to it, it sounds like what the most boring people at the bar or the people they don't let into the bar were talking about. I mean, we were, we were, we had a learning curve to go. Up. We're still the nerds at the bar. Sure. I mean, to sure. Be honest. And that's, that's the, that's the, that's the, the, the tagline for, the 15th anniversary celebration. Not as boring as we used to be. John yeah. Dickerson. <laughs> now, Emily, I, I have really a question for you. really know how to you. sell them. Emily, I have a question for you. <laughs> Axios, Emily, Axios reported yesterday the president is planning mass pardons like Christmas gifts, even to people not asking for them. Are there rules on issuing pardons, or can he just sort of load the pardons in a tank and crop dust all his cronies with forgiveness? He can give them out as he chooses. Maybe he can't pardon himself, but even that isn't clear. But what I like the best about the story you just told is people are being offered pardons who don't want pardons. They're like, I didn't do a crime. I don't want the stigma of your suggestion that I did. Like, please don't pardon me. Well, that's, that's, where, something that's, that, where we are. that's something that I think a lot of people don't understand is that uh, there's a ruling, about a 100-year-old ruling saying from the Supreme Court saying that Accepting a pardon is a admission of, of guilt. Right. It suggests that you did something wrong and that there is something to forgive here. And so there should be some kind of limit on pardons in terms of, you know, how the president actually uses them, um, some sense that you're that there's actually wrongdoing. And I think it's really important for us not to lose that norm, but it seems like it is being lost as we speak. David, I want to ask you about one of your uh, particular uh, idiosyncrasies uh, that I've noticed over the years, is that you're, you're sort of famous among GabFest fans for being okay with political corruption, that a little corruption is okay. When Trump is out of office, do you think, and this is for everybody, but at first to David, should there be investigations? Because don't you have a sense that this, this organization made the Harding administration look like choir boys? And whether or not they're thrown in jail, we should know what happened? I think I was for political corruption before Donald Trump showed up. I'm for political corruption in the sense that I think a little bit of favor doing. Politics is sort of the art of doing favors for each other. You get a little something from me, I get a little something from you, and some of that can be a little bit corrupt. I, so like I earmarks think, and stuff like that you're okay with? 100% okay with earmarks. I think what's shocking about what's happening with Trump, we, will, we may never know how much is given away, how many people have drilled things, how much soot has been allowed to be dumped into the atmosphere, how much mercury I'm getting to ingest because some Texas uh, company is allowed to pour mercury. And it, it's, it's, it is horrifying to imagine what they've done. That said, I don't know that, I don't know that for the country's good that years of investigation to what the Trumps have done 
is going to get us very far. But if uh, we don't investigate, if we don't at least look under the rock, then we lose that kind of deterrence, right? Yeah. Then the next people come along and there's this, you've, you've just lowered the bar for what the next set of politicians feel like they can do. One of, the da one of the problems is that, or one of the reasons you need to find out what happened is because in the old days, the norms would be, um, would be policed by people in your own party. I mean, so that you could agree that somebody had stepped over a line and nobody should do that without necessarily having to go all the way to having an investigation. But in, uh, where, when you're in a moment when norms can be broken and nobody from your team will speak up, the only way you can nail down the information and say, this in fact was a line that was crossed is by taking it all the way through to an investigation. Right, but, um, John, is, but then you end up with like impeachment where, I, and which was the right thing to do, but where you have the, the country, I mean, sure. you have a country operating half of them in a mass delusion or a willful delusion. Well, but that's people didn't believe the information that chose to ignore and not believe. And that's so worrying that you have these people living these two totally separate systems. So if you can, that, you uncover the truth. But then what happens? Like if well, but, the country doesn't listen. But I mean, if you look at the, the, the case being made now, uh, the president's fraudulent case about the election, one of the ways you might be able to argue to somebody that it is truly fraudulent is that the courts have thrown it out with such prejudice. Now, that may not convince millions of people. And one of the dangers of Republican leaders just allowing the president to lie about the election and seemingly to support him is that it allows that idea to sink in. But if you are going to eject that idea from people who uh, believe something that is not true, you have the evidence of the courts and the judges, some of whom were appointed by President Trump, who say, not only is there no case here, but you shouldn't be asking to do what you're asking to do at all, even based on the, even though you're also asking to do it based on incredibly flimsy evidence. And that, if you're going to try to argue that this is beyond the bounds, at least you now have a number of judges who have asserted that. And they're not just, these aren't, you know, political pundits saying this, these are actual judges, which seems to make a stronger case, though I, I recognize lots of people won't believe that case. We just have to get 74 million people to listen to the Slate political gab fest every week. <laughs> And, would, and the country would be fine. Uh, we have to take a quick break, but when we come back, I will ask the hosts why they think the GOP is going along with the president's claims of election fraud. Stick around.